Hey there, Internet. We are back with our second Champions Play Champions interview. Uh, yesterday, Dylan joined Binwin Broadensbottom, a.k.a. Scott Kurtz, in the uh, black void of the Internet where he's been hanging out. And I don't know why my back screen just disappeared, so okay. All right, so that's going to happen. Um, as you can see, I am not Dylan Wilkes. I am Chris Dupuy, the live services manager here at Codename Entertainment. Uh, Dylan has caught the office bug, so I will be here to uh, interview um, Anna Prosser, uh, aka Evelyn Marthane, our human paladin in the game. Uh, Anna's going to be joining us in a few moments. The room that she was going to, she had booked for the stream was uh, busy. So uh, she's going to jump in in a moment. But for now, we're going to talk in the black void because my background messed up. And we're just going to do it live. Ooh, and I think she's just joining in. Anna, are you here? I have no audio on Anna at the moment. Anna is checking. So um, thank you all for joining us today. We've got a special one-hour interview with... Uh, Anna, and we're going to be talking about Evelyn, we're going to be talking about Idol Champions, we're going to be talking about this week, which is super duper special. Uh, Idol Champions is launching on consoles. We've got, uh, and please let me know if the audio is working okay. Um, uh, we're launching on consoles this week. Yesterday we had our grand launch on PS4. Uh, it was so awesome to read comments from folks that were logging into PS4 and checking out the game. Uh, we're really happy with the results so far, and we're just going to keep rolling it all week. Uh, folks that are on Steam, Android tablets, iPads, and uh, PS4 can see the new console celebration dialogue that's popped up. Uh, with a countdown starting to noon on Friday, and that's where we're just going to start. Uh, we're just going to start giving out freebies every day. You're going to be able to log in, grab a chest with four unique epic items from chosen from the CNE team, um, and as long as you log in and grab your chest, it's free stuff every single day for seven days. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, on top of that, we've got uh, our Simril event, and I'm just. Or, never mind, I'm not going to move that. Uh, we got our similar event going on right now. Unfortunately, that event will not be live on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Uh, your first events are going to be Winter Shield, which will start on the day after Christmas. Uh, we didn't want to unlock... Uh, Simmeral on consoles and only give the players three to five days to play through it. Uh, we figured that was a little too stressful. So the console launch is going to launch without an active event. Uh, so all the talk that we have about Simmeral and Warden and Daddyus, uh, just ignore that for now, PlayStation uh, players and Xbox players when you pop in on Friday. Uh, but on Friday, we're going to start giving away freebies in the game every single day. Uh, and if you collect four out of the seven chests, you'll get an additional five gold chests, as well as an awesome new golden epic for the uh, newly revamped Arcan, the Oathbreaker Dragonborn. Uh, so I believe my guest is logged in. Let's see if I can hear some sound. Anna, can you hear me? I'm seeing your mouth moving, but no sound. Hang on. Hey, can you hear me oh, now? I can hear you now. I could That's use so a cool. volume up just a little bit, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why all of a sudden the sound is not working for you. Um... Well, let's uh, let's just move over to here so I can get out of the black void, and uh, I can leave it on that microphone, but it's going to sound not great. Would you prefer for me to keep trying to find you a better one? Well, let's let's ask Chad. Chad, how is uh, how's Anna's voice for you? She's a little quiet for me, but if you guys can hear her fine, uh, and I'm I happy to. I can make it to... louder. It's just not high quality. Ooh. Is that better? Yeah, that's that's better for me. Okay. Okay. So unless we hear otherwise in chat, we're going to assume this is good. All right. So, Anna, thank you so much yeah. for joining us. I really appreciate you uh, jumping in on your lunch break to chat with us. Yeah, no problem. Sorry for the, the late scramble. Usually here at Twitch, uh, I'm, I'm one of few people who uses these rooms, but today it was booked solid. So someone was in here and I had to just kick them out. Well, we appreciate you uh, kicking them out and ruining their day. <laughs> Good. I'm happy uh, to be here. <laughs> good. And, uh, you know, to start, um, before we get into talking about Evelyn, before we get into uh, talking about Idol Champions, I want to I thank you for, uh, for all your work. I'm a huge fan of you on DCA and all your different hosting duties. And uh, I, I got to be honest, when I got the email from Dylan saying he was sick today, I was just a little excited that I got to hang out <laughs> with you for an hour. <laughs> well, I am super happy to be here. And you are 
are welcome and thank you for liking it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, in the background, while we're chatting, we're going to be playing through Idle Champions. We're going to be playing through the uh, Simril variant for um, Warden, the new Warforged, um, uh, Warforged Warlock. Uh, and we're playing through the Frostbitten event. So you'll see the icons, the little frosty icons on the outside of the formation. Uh, that means that those champions are dealing about 50% of the damage. Uh, and I've got an evil in uh, formation, and I do have to All right. jump in and add a few players. Uh, we are playing on the PS4 interface of the game, and the game is now out on PlayStation 4. We're super excited about the revamped UI. We've been working for a couple of months on it, and we're really excited on how it came out. Um, and let me just throw this formation together. Level up Evelyn. Strix, I can't get Strix yet. No, oh, need more gold. Um, and there we go. Okay, so we've got some questions from the internet. Let's go ahead and start there as I move around multiple screens. I think we need another screen in this office. <laughs> Where's my questions? Oh, they're right in front of me. Okay. Uh, okay, so to start, uh, can you tell the players, because some of the players are coming in from PS4, they're brand new to the game, uh, they don't know a lot about our, our event champions, uh, can you tell us about uh, Evelyn the Champion? Absolutely. So Evelyn is a character from Dice Camera Action, which is a weekly live stream show that Wizards of the Coast, Dungeons & Dragons itself, made, gosh, three years ago now, something like that. And we stream every Tuesday from 4 to 6 p.m. And uh, our characters have been through a lot. We have quite a reputation <laughs> for uh, emotional trauma, but the kind that leads to more understanding of self and deep bonds with your friends. That's yeah. what I like to think of it as. Um, but Evelyn is a human paladin of Lathander. She's about five feet tall, but you wouldn't know it because she always flies wearing her magic winged boots. And she is exceptionally strong and tough for her size. Um, and her kind of cherubic look belies a very savage, smashing, tanking kind of, uh, <laughs> of character. And um, she is originally from a kind of provincial town outside of Waterdeep, where she, it was recently revealed, actually is kind of a, a noble person of note. But she left her family very young to train as a paladin and kind of um, you know, forsaking that life, she has now become an adventurer with her friends Strix, Dieth, and Paulton. That's awesome. And we have uh, Strix and Paulton in the game. Um, oh, sorry, Strix, Strix and Dieth. Right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, Paulton is uh, coming at a date to be decided later. Mm -hmm. uh, we're super excited to get all of the DCA crews in. And I don't know if you noticed, but we've got uh, some C team members joining us. Uh, we've got uh, Dinar in the game already, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to announce some new C team members joining us soon, so we could get some uh, Waffle Inc. Uh, adventures going. Yeah, it's been so cool that we're in the same cinematic universe, if you will, with <laughs> Activision Inc. and uh, the C team. It's yeah, really it's cool. so cool when you guys get to cross over because you were just on uh, the main stage, right? I was. I was on Acquisitions Incorporated, which is like a D and D nerd dream come true. It was so fun. I've gotten to see a couple of games and uh, and they are super duper fun. What was it like being uh, on the stage? It was crazy because I have, well, I, I said at first, I was like, I've never played D&D in front of that many people before, which isn't true because I have on stream. Yep. But having all of those people reacting live and like the, you know, the laughs or the gasps or the like, you know, cheers. It's really cool because I think the reason I love D&D &D and streaming so much is that I think it's a cool new emergent art form to have this kind of massively multiplayer storytelling experience where the audience maybe doesn't have as much control over my character, but they certainly have an influence on what happens and okay. on my character and they help um, create the moments and deepen the moments and even sometimes give the players ideas of what to do or name things or create jokes or whatever it is. So um, being on the acting stage was that in a really cool real time feeling. And then of course, you know, Acquisitions Incorporated was one of the first major D&D live stream or podcasts and has such a deep, um, I don't know, I have such a deep respect for it. So getting to play with those characters was really a trip. 
it was really fun. That's awesome. And getting to getting to bring Evelyn along too, because there's a weird feeling when you have a character that you have played as much and as long as I have with Evelyn. It's like bringing my friend to this place and seeing what she'll do. And and I kind of got to experience like watching her in a way interacting with the acting characters as well, which was really fun. Interesting. So when you're in character as Evelyn, do, does she kind of take over or do you still think about it as uh, Anna playing this role? In a lot of ways, she does take over. And I think that that's only because of how long I've been playing her that she's become so fleshed out that sometimes I'm like, I don't know what she's going to do until I get into this situation. And then sometimes she'll react to something and I won't even know why. And then I'll spend the whole week being like, why did Evelyn do that? And then, you know, deepening her backstory and her character and stuff. So there's a part of it that's very intentional in that I work really hard to flesh out the character and know her really, really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the part that's reactive where I go into a situation and I don't know what she's going to do. But like, here's a great example. So with Acquisitions Incorporated, I knew that I wanted there to be some sort of funny weirdness between Evelyn and Jim Dark Magic mm -hmm. based on Strix and Jim's relationship. <laughs> and so, and Holly had come to me and been like, you should tell Jim that Strix says he's bad at magic. And so I had that in my back pocket, like I had that basic plan, but I didn't know how Evelyn was going to execute it because Evelyn's not, she's never the person to like make fun of someone mm -hmm. or insult someone. So I didn't know how that would happen. And I was like, I don't know, we'll just see. And then what came out was Evelyn being like, you're so good at magic, keep trying, you're doing a good job. And like, you know, being patronizing unintentionally. So right. I knew the general framework that I created, but then once I kind of let Evelyn free in it, she was the one that made it funny. Yeah, that is the perfect way for Evelyn to point out someone's bad at magic. Just be like, come on, you can do it. Yeah. You keep trying <laughs> Try a hard. little bit harder. Yeah. <laughs> so how long have you been playing Evelyn? Was DCA the, the, the birth of Evelyn or did, was she around before that? This is actually Evelyn B2 because there was an Evelyn Marthane that I played in Miss Clicks D and D Outbreak, which was another D and D live stream show that I did with Miss Clicks, which is on YouTube. You can look for M I S S C L I K S mm -hmm. outbreak, and you'll find the whole series. It was pretty short lived because Outbreak was a zombie campaign, and so uh, we did not survive the zombie horde very well. Um, but that Evelyn was um, she was Marthane because her deity was Martha, mm -hmm. uh, and she was also kind of noble, but she was much more like the mom type and a little bit more. Um, about like caring for other characters than she was like blatantly optimistic. So there, there's some differences. I think she looked a little bit different too, but the main idea of this like overly optimistic um, kind of cherub type uh, paladin was what I took and then made the Elam that is now. So if you watch that one, her core is still the same, but you'll notice a lot of differences that are like, oh, that's not, that's not Evelyn's backstory or that's not how Evelyn is. But a lot of her like, um, her brother's name is still the same, some of her background, except her parents in that one, um, like died horribly in a fire, like the typical, ah, oh, my family is dead. No, they died no, Disney fire. backstory. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, but yeah. Well, I think so with, she, all, uh, with all with all D&D characters, it's sort of an, an emerging narrative, you know? You mm -hmm. have an idea and then you're, like, like you said, you're in the role and you take it in a different direction and then just, uh, you kind of retcon because it worked really well. Yeah. I like when I make a backstory to do something like uh, with with this Evelyn B2, I kind of was like, Evelyn's parents died. No one really talks about it. She seems to think it might be partly her fault. And then I didn't know what, what had happened to her mm -hmm. parents. Um, I just let that kind of be vague. And then the details got filled in as I learned more about her and we had more knowledge of the world and things like that. So I kind of like to have a, a framework and then figure it out as I go. Okay. So, um, what do you think about, uh, so Evelyn's been in the game for five or six months now. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, she's a super powerful character. People are really excited to, to get her and keep her up in the front, especially with the new tanking and healing update. Uh, what do you think about Evelyn moving on to consoles and being on PlayStation and Xbox? It's really fun. It's so cool because, um, there's, 
I love that um, Evelyn on PC is someone you can have kind of hanging out with you while you work or, you know, like that's how I kind of use Idle Champions is it's a, a second monitor situation. Mm -hmm. um, but I like the idea of like now you can hang out with Evelyn on your couch oh, and yeah. you have her around in your living room. And I think I think that's going to be really fun. I, I personally am a, a big PS4 fan. So um, I was excited. Yeah, I uh, I got early access on the Xbox build a couple of weeks ago so that we could test it in the live environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, one morning before work, I was downstairs and I was playing around, making sure there weren't any glitches in the tutorial. And my daughter came downstairs and she likes to play with me because she wants all the girls in the formation and she wants to move them around. <laughs> and she came downstairs and she's like, oh, it's on the TV too? <laughs> it was awesome. That's great. Yeah. Um, and, uh, what's your, what's your console gaming setup like at home? You said you're a fan of PS4. Do you have both or do you just, uh, play PS4 at home? I, I end up usually having most all consoles just because of my line of work. Mm. Um, cause inevitably there's going to be an exclusive that I'm going to need to play so that I know it, so that I can talk about it. So generally I usually have most consoles, but my, um, you know, you usually have one that you is like your go-to for like. I watch Netflix on it, and I play games on it, and mm -hmm. if I look for something, so that's my PS4. And then um, I, I think, yeah, that's that's my main media console setup, and I use my Switch quite a bit as well when mm -hmm. I'm on the go. Um, and I, uh, I just have, I don't know, a pretty basic but like very comfy setup. Lots of blankets, lots of pillows. It's definitely my my relaxed space. That's nice. I've got I've got toys all over my couch. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> sitting on a on a superhero girl every other day. It's like, oh, Jesus. Um, so uh, what are you playing right now on console? What, what, what games are you playing? I, uh, well, I've been playing a ton of Let's Go Eevee on mm. my Switch. Um, we went the Pokemon route in our house. Yeah, yeah. Or well, uh, Pikachu, The sorry. Pikachu route, yeah. Uh, it's like I'm traveling so much all the time that most of my time that I actually get to play anything is on airplanes. Mm. So, uh, the Switch. Yeah, so I've been playing that. But uh, as far as on my PS4, I've had the new Tomb Raider downloaded since it came out and haven't gotten to play it yet. So every day when I go home, I'm like, okay, how many hours of sleep do I need? Do I have time to start this now? Because I know I'm going to want to play it for a few hours and I just haven't gotten to start it yet. So I'm hoping over the holidays, that's what I'm going to be jumping into. Yeah, it's like that initial three hour commitment. It's like, I exactly. got to get in, I got to get through the tutorials so I feel comfortable and I can come back to it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've been I've been playing a lot of Spider Man right now, and uh, yeah, it's so much fun. But I've heard that game's really good, especially because the story focuses so much on empathy, which I'm super into. Yeah, no, that that's a that's a very good point. I mean, it wasn't all just um, just monsters or enemies showing up for enemies' sake. There's a whole storyline there. You feel for a lot of these villains, and uh, in much the way that uh, Daredevil season one just kind of really made you rethink the kingpin uh this this game had some really complex character backstories cool it's really good uh so let's get into some of the ask evelyn questions that the fans have yeah. been, uh, thrown out there uh if you were to create a more villainous character uh what would you use as a guideline for the creation such as class race and background a more villainous character yeah um well the other character that I play most often right now is on Trapped in the Birdcage, which is DM'd by Holly Conrad, who plays mm -hmm. Strix. And uh, I specifically set out to make that character very different from Evelyn. I don't know for sure if I'd say villainous, because she doesn't like do evil for evil's sake or um, necessarily like set out to hurt people. But she is th one of the most selfish characters I could possibly make. So I made her a rogue with um, a penchant for stealing and manipulating. Mm. Uh, and I, I'm i having a lot of fun with her in that, like, the same way that Evelyn surprises and delights me, she surprises and disgusts me, <laughs> <laughs> if that makes sense. So I made her, um, she's a human rogue, but she has also a lot of proficiency in, like, disguise, and she wears an omni dress, which is a magical item that can change into any outfit. So the way that she's kind of gone about life is fitting in wherever she needs to in order to get whatever she needs to to survive. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that. I also think it's fun whenever you um, make a character to do something that makes it less, um, 
less like you would assume. Like for example, mm -hmm. Evelyn is a paladin, which you would assume is lawful good, but actually she is neutral good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, giving it an edge that makes it like, okay, how does that change what you normally assume a paladin would do? Um, and so if I were making a more villainous character, I'd be thinking about that too. Like, how do I take someone who's like, okay, they're flat evil, but what what difference do they have from someone else that you would assume is a villain? Maybe they have a weakness for animals. Maybe they specifically have a fear of children. You know, like give them something that makes them um, either flawed or unique, I guess. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Um, how does Evelyn, uh, Ginger Buck Cat asks, how does she sound when she talks? <laughs> uh, Evelyn has a what I can't remember what her Amphail. She has an Amphalian accent. People think it's a southern accent. Mm. It's not. Yeah, it's I... Amphail, which is her hometown. Uh, but she sounds <laughs> she's got a little bit of a little drawl and she just thinks you're the cutest little thing and she wants to just bless your heart. And her voice is just a little higher than mine, a little more nasal than mine, and just has that that little twang to it. Nice. Yeah. She's um, actually a very poor imitation of a woman I know from ten Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> does she know that she's the uh, the source? No, she does not. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, question from GU Comics. What did you think about Jeremy Crawford as your DM? Oh, man, that was so fun. Jeremy has, you know, he, stepping into Chris Perkins' shoes as the DM of Exorcist Incorporated had to be so intimidating. And I'm sure that the temptation was like, how do I, you know, I, I assume a lot of lesser DMs would be like, how do I imitate Chris? How do I replace Chris? But I feel like what Jeremy did is he stepped up and was like, Chris has been a fantastic DM. I'm not going to be Chris. I'm going to show you I'm also a fantastic DM. And I respect Chris enough to like, let him do his thing and I'm going to do mine. And it was so wonderful what he brought to the table and his kind of um he has this smoothness of narrative that's really captivating and he obviously knows the rules like backwards and forwards so um and it's really interesting because you think of of chris who's lead story designer and uh jeremy who's i i think it's is it lead rules designer or yeah I, I don't remember his actual title, but he focuses mostly on the game design. Mm -hmm. um, and you would think that that would mean Chris is better at story and worse at rules, and Jeremy is better at rules and worse at story. And I think that's not true about either of them. I think they're both excellent at utilizing both to tell a really captivating story. Um, and so I, th I thought the way that Jeremy handled the uh, inevitable Pat Rothfuss trying to bend the rules was really, really fun. He knew that was going to come up. He knew he would have to have his own answer to that. Um, and the way that he gracefully, like, knew enough about the characters to highlight them, but also gave them enough room as a new DM to be like, you teach me who you are, and then I will react to you that way. I just thought he was exceptional, and I thought it was, I thought what he brought to the table was new and fresh and individual and just wonderful and I think um isn't he I think he actually dms Chris Perkins in a game yeah um, I know he's got like, he's got a weekend game that he's been running yeah. for quite some time and I think Chris is part of that I'm not sure yeah so I know and and I thought it was really graceful how when he took the stage he took a moment to stand up and address his relationship with Chris too and kind of say like I got Chris's blessing it's really important to me that you know that the torch was passed uh, with good feeling, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I, and I think as much as like someone who's maybe outside of D and D might not understand how important that is. Um, those of us who create stories together for this long in universes that we love this much understand and appreciate that kind of like reverence, I think. So that was really cool. No, I agree. I've, I've had the, the pleasure and the luck to, uh, play under both of them, uh, as DMs and they are incredibly gracious and uh and super great at what they do and uh it was it was really great to see chris uh jeremy step into that role and and really run with it and and mm -hmm. i agree uh making sure that that transition was as transparent and clear and exciting as possible uh mm -hmm. was super important i think he did a great job 
I loved his NPCs too. I thought that they were so lively and fun, and I fell in love with them right away. <laughs> uh, let's see. We got some more questions here. All right, from Garwar, uh, one of our uh, community players. Uh, does Evelyn realize Todd is courting her, or does she just see him as a new friend as, and is missing that completely? That's a good question. Um, I think it's a little bit of a mix of both. And this is one of the things that I mentioned earlier that I'm still kind of learning about Evelyn. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if you really sat her down and was like, hey, Evelyn, you logically see that this person is courting you, right? She'd probably be like, yeah, you're right. I am, She's not stupid. Like, she understands. He gave me flowers. That is more than just a friend. Like, she understands those things logically. But I think emotionally, she has always been in such a place where duty comes before everything else, um, where she is a servant who's not supposed to be, um, to put herself above anybody else. She got taken from her family very young and all the friends she ever had were very much um, at a distance. In fact, there's a backstory that I haven't shared before about kind of the most special person that she had um, with her in paladin training, who you might all even call like a significant other, but because they were both like, we're only here to do our duty, that significant other was like, oh, the feelings are not part of this. like were, you know, you're special to me, but only in so far as, you know, we spend some time together while we're here training and then we go on in our service of Lathander. So I think that emotionally, the way Evelyn processes courting is she will get that like, oh, that person is treating me special. And then it'll shut down and be like, oh, but you're like, don't read too far into it. Don't try to like um, think that they're telling you you're special. Like it has to be very overt for mm -hmm. someone to come out and be like, I want to court you for her to actually process and deal with that. Otherwise, she's just going to assume like, oh, we're just really special friends or, um, you know, they just want to spend time with me or whatever, which is maybe a little bit like, I think it just points to a lot of the like deep issues that Evelyn is still processing. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Do you think that that, do you, do you think that she's sort of still holding the torch for that per first partner? Or do you think that she's uh, guarding herself against having that, uh, uh, that sort of confrontation again? I think that she has had so many of these experiences like that. Like, I mean, you, you see it with Paulton as well, that mm -hmm. she um, had it, these deep feelings of at least infatuation for Paulton. And he was like, hey, uh, feelings are a waste of time. I'm not interested in the emotional side of things. And she's just so continually been told like, don't get in, don't get attached. I don't want that from so many people. Um, that I don't know if she's necessarily guarding her heart so much as she's like, oh, I can never expect to have that. Um, hmm. Although, it's a super I sad think, story, Anna. I know it is. It is really sad. I think it'll have a happy ending. I really do. Because um, another thing that she, I think she said in some of the backstory writing that I've done. Uh, and I don't know, maybe I'm revealing a lot more deep backstory stuff that I that I haven't said before. So no, I love this. This is great. I don't change the industry. Um, but she, uh, her parents, in in at least my background lore, were kind of an anomaly because her father was also a paladin of Lathander. And I, I think that probably if you're a paladin and you spend every day just kind of like doing your duty and you're off all across the world adventuring and things, it's probably hard to have a committed relationship, uh, mm -hmm. a romantic relationship. And I think that Evelyn's parents managed to do that somehow. Her mom was kind of this, um, you know, the the lady of the town that oversaw things. And I see her as kind of this, like, um, not politician so much as, like, someone who, who made the town run and, like, is responsible for things and helped people and everything. So I see her mom as this very, like, um, individual, strong, powerful woman, and her dad as this like adventuring, um, you know, blessed kind of, you know, traveling person. And then they loved each other and just like made it work. Mm -hmm. And so I think that Evelyn holds them up as like, that's what she would want in her life so much is this, this partner, this soulmate, but that she thinks that that's like so, so rare that she could never expect to be able to have a relationship like that. 
um, and that she thinks that Lathander and her relationship with Lathander should be enough, and like only if Lathander chooses to bless her with that kind of relationship would she ever expect it. So I think that's like her hope in her heart of hearts, um, but she has trouble like allowing herself to believe it. That's so we'll great. see. Who yeah. knows? This is awesome hearing so much backstory. This is this is great. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is Evelyn's favorite color? Gold. <laughs> <laughs> All the gold. Gold. Uh, let's see. Uh, if Evelyn, uh, this is actually a good question. Uh, not at all, because I would have asked you this eventually. Uh, if Evelyn were to get a new skin, uh, which of her weapons would you want her to use? The hot, uh, the, uh, the heart of uh, Spinelli? Yeah, she's been using that one the longest, and that's the one that she, spoiler alert, defeated Strahd with. So I, that would definitely be what I picked. All right. Yeah, so I don't know if you've noticed, but we've been starting to introduce uh, skins for our characters. Uh, you can see me running with Party Time Jarl Axel uh, with his <laughs> balloon sword of epicness and Pirate Brunor, which was unlocked in one of our recent uh, events. Cool. And I've also got uh, Undead Celeste, which is in the new Founders Pack that we just released. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to continue to uh, to update skins on champions and give players really cool ways to, to personalize their uh, adventuring crews. Uh, and it, at some point, we'll send you an email and we can chat about uh, Evelyn's next skin. Ooh, that would be fun. <laughs> I mean, the one that, that begs to be made is Construct Evelyn. Oh, I know, I know. I think that's got to be it, but... Uh, mm -hmm. There's and then there's, you know, her outfit has changed uh, since she lost, I forget how she even lost her clothes. They probably burned or something, but she now wears a dress and you can see her like um, the markings that we usually call tattoos, but they're not tattoos. They're markings left over from when she was a construct and got that boon from Lathander. So she has all those markings on her shoulders and arms and stuff. So there, there have been a few skin evolutions of Evelyn in the game. That's awesome. Well, we'll definitely uh, we'll definitely hit you up and talk to you about uh, you know what version you'd like to see in the game when we uh, come back around to Evelyn's event. Cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, Plain Introduction wants to know why are you and Evelyn so fabulous? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I assume by fabulous you mean that Evelyn has a sense of style. And I guess the why for that would be if I am in a fantasy world, why not make my character look just like stylish AF, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, last season, uh, Chris hinted at a vampire that killed Evelyn's father in Undermountain. Uh, oh, would yeah. Evelyn kill said vampire or show mercy, or would it be up to how that episode unfolds? The way that I play neutral good is um, lawful good would be I always do the right thing based on my code of ethics all the time, no matter what. Chaotic good would be I do whatever feels right to me at the time. Mm -hmm. no, neutral good I play as I do whatever is needed for the people that I am with or the situation I'm in at the time. So not just what looks good to me, but what is best for the people I'm with. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I play it. And it's not like that's the only way to do neutral good, but it helps me conceptualize Evelyn. So um, I think that would she kill the vampire definitely depends on is this vampire just outright evil? Uh, can they explain why it happened? Are they repentant? Does letting them live put other people in danger? Does letting them live possibly serve Lathander better than killing them? But the other really important mechanic to Evelyn that I haven't harped on as much in later seasons because I harped on it so much in early seasons is that she really doesn't see death as like as bad as normal people do mm -hmm. because she sees it as just the the beginning of a new dawn kind of being sent on to your next thing because yeah. that's a very lathanderian principle is Absolutely. just every the renewal and the new dawn and so and she's died like three or four times now and and had a new dawn herself so she 
she sees killing someone as kind of a, you cease to do what you're doing right now, you rethink yourself, and you come back in a new way, kind of. <laughs> and sometimes you're a construct. Right, you know. <laughs> uh, let's see, this is a pretty long one. Okay. Uh, Paulton may never become a full, a true follower of Lathander, but at least he had a relationship with the Raven Queen, and Nate has even expressed interest in becoming a warlock in her service. How would Evelyn feel about that? Would it bring them closer, or would it tear them apart? That's another reason that I chose neutral good, because I, um, I don't think Evelyn has that compulsion of, like, you have to serve Lathander for me to understand you, um... I think for her, it's a lot more like the basic principles of of good and the service of Lathander are really important to her. And understanding of how much she loves Lathander and the relationship she has with him are really important to her. Mm -hmm. So I don't think just the nature of like, you serve a different deity that will tear us apart, whatever happened. I think it would more depend on, um, are you doing things that are counter to what Lathander would want? Um, that would tear them apart. Okay. If that makes sense. Good answer. Uh, question from Platinum21777. Uh, what is the best way to stay in character for you? Hmm, the best way to stay in character. Uh, I think allowing myself to be immersed in the game. Um, and for me, that's a very mentally visual thing, if that makes sense. Um, when I'm fully immersed in the game, I'm very much seeing it in my head. Sure. And so if I'm seeing the, if I'm in Evelyn's world and I'm seeing the things that are around Evelyn, that helps me interact with it as Evelyn because Anna is never in that world. Um, and I don't know, it's funny to talk about staying in character um, because Part of the fun of D&D as a performative storytelling art form is that part of the artfulness of it is knowing when to be in character and when to not be in character. Um, knowing when to narrate or when to react as Anna versus react as Evelyn is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Mm -hmm. Like, how can I um, enhance, for example, a Paulton fourth wall break better? Like, if Paulton breaks the fourth wall, is it funnier for Evelyn to be like, what? I don't understand. Or for Anna to be like, oh my gosh, Nate. You know what I mean? And, so, <laughs> and both of those are valid in a D&D stream, depending on uh, on what best ser serves the story. Mm -hmm. So I guess the way I best stay in character is allowing both Anna and Evelyn to be present in those spaces and then choosing which one gets to react to each moment. <laughs> which one comes out now? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, as a lighting designer, and this is a question from Plain Introduction, and thanks everyone for uh, tossing all these questions at us. I appreciate it. Uh, as a lighting designer, I love that you did that live show at TwitchCon. What made you all decide to do that live theater style game, or whose idea was it? <laughs> it was my dream, and I made it a reality. Uh, my job, my full-time job, the reason I'm here right now is I'm lead producer for Twitch Studios. And one of the most major things we do every year is we are given the glitch stage at TwitchCon and told to fill it with great content. Um, and so that means that I pitch a lot of ideas that I want to do this, I want to do that, here's the reasons that I want to do it. Um, and when I pitched the idea of doing that D&D show, there was a part of me that was like, they'll never let me do this. <laughs> They'll never let me do this. But a lot of it made a lot of sense. D&D &D Beyond is a Twitch-owned property, and so mm -hmm. there's been um, a desire to kind of put that at the forefront, and they were really interested. Uh, Dungeons & Dragons is a really important partner for Twitch, so they were really interested in coming on board. Um, there were a lot of uh, performers that were either going to be at TwitchCon or that we wanted to come to TwitchCon that could be involved in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all of those reasons made made the powers that be be like, all right, Anna, this is great. Go ahead and produce the show. And I was like, really? <laughs> so, <laughs> so everything beyond that was, um, I was so blessed to have kind of a, an opportunity to say, what have I never seen done for a D&D &D live show before so that I can do something completely new and inspiring, um, which is one of the directives of Twitch Studios is mm -hmm. to think, how can we inspire people to make new and different and exciting kinds of content? So what can I do to add to the D&D &D streaming space? And so we came up with this idea of wanting to 
um, Take Away the Table, which actually had been done uh, in a different way by Wizards of the Coast during their Stream of Many Eyes. They did mm. the off the table game, um, which was a modified Dungeons and Dragons game. It wasn't Dungeons and Dragons itself, and it was on camera, not on stage. Mm -hmm. But I was like, what if we make kind of a staged reading where we have props, we have um, costumes, but it's still exactly Dungeons and Dragons, and we still narrate things, but we also get to move around and we also get to act things out. And uh, a lot of it was like, we don't know if this will work, but, <laughs> but let's try it. Um, and then, you know, we got to design this big LED screen that put us actually in uh, these rooms. And thankfully, all of the players were down because nobody in that group had ever played Dungeons and Dragons like a LARP before. Mm -hmm. And, I, and you know, we, we all did it. So, so to answer your question, I guess it was... Um, I guess it was mostly my idea. And I'm really glad that you, you liked it because it was kind of like my magnum opus of TwitchCon content. That's awesome. Congratulations. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, have you DM'd since the Lost Minds of Fandalver on Misclicks, or does being a DM not interest you at the moment? Well, that's a good question. Um, being a DM very much does interest me. It's just that right now, the other projects that I'm doing around D&D interest me more in terms of what I want to devote time to. Um, meaning I'm doing a lot of producing work like I did for TwitchCon. I am doing a lot of stuff around Dice Camera Action, trying to behind the scenes, make sure that we have a really good year next year in terms mm -hmm. of appearances. You saw that we recently came out with merch. That's something that I've been working on. So I'm trying to really strengthen the things that I'm already doing and spending a lot of time on Dice Camera Action. And I don't have the extra like even one hour per week that I would need to do to prep as a DM. Yeah, um, it takes a little bit of work. Yeah, and so the other thing was that I did Lost Minds, which I really enjoyed, but um, I was way too focused on trying to do it perfectly and on trying to follow the rules, um, and, and not even follow the rules, follow the adventure. Mm -hmm. And so next time I would like to do something where I DM, but I do a more free world of my own creation yep. and how that works. And so again, that's going to take a lot of more time preparation. <laughs> um, so, excuse me. So being a DM definitely does interest me. I feel like I learned a lot from that and I'm still learning and picking up things as I do D and D um, with lots and lots of other people. But I think that'll probably be like maybe mid next year that I would do another DM type of show. We'll that's see. awesome. And uh, sounds like uh, dice camera actions can continue through 2019. That's, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for wizards, but that's my understanding. <laughs> awesome. That's exciting to hear. Uh, after guesting on Acquisitions Incorporated, would you be interested in guesting in other games, like, say, Critical Role or Adventure Zone? Question Absolutely. From if you, if anyone out there from Critical Role or Adventure Zone is watching and they're like, gee, would Anna Prosser want to come on our show? The answer is yes. <laughs> I'd love to. You know, this question, these kind of questions get asked a lot, like, would you ever want to be on the show? Would you ever want to be on the show? And generally, the answer is always, yeah, I'd love to hang out and guest and play with so many different people in the D and D community. Um, it's just a matter of like, you know, we're all in different locations. Our schedules are crazy, and you know, sometimes, even though our characters, we love them all, they don't necessarily fit with each other's stories. So, I would absolutely be willing. I don't know if that means it'll ever happen or anytime soon, but I would love to. I'd love to see. Uh, I'd love to see you guesting on one of those shows. That'd be awesome to see the interaction of uh, Evelyn or another character with the crew. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, Ark and Sunseeker, not a question, but just a comment. Uh, Anna, I love Evelyn, and I've been catching up on DCA. Thank you. That's awesome. I always am really excited to hear that people are catching up on DCA because uh, it's really fun to experience it along with them. Like, you know, uh, there are major episodes like episode 52 or 73 that if people are like, oh, I'm catching up, I'm like, oh, where are you? You know what? <laughs> So that I know what they're about to experience, um, and that's that's really fun to re-experience it through people like that. Yeah, I've got and to say it's really it's just really cool because a, a live show like ours, um, it's really easy to kind of have like a drop off in people watching because mm -hmm. you might be watching from the beginning and like get behind. And our fan base, like, thank you so much to everyone who consistently like even if they get behind they catch back up they bring new people in so those people start from the beginning and catch up and it's just like 
it's amazing and an honor that people want to spend that much time watching our story. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, uh, being uh, working on a D&D game and working with so many content creators like yourself, it's challenging to keep up with all the games. Yes. Um, but for DCA, what I've loved is uh, the podcasts. I can listen to it in the car on the way to work. And mm -hmm. after like four days of commuting, I can get through an episode and it's right. super fun. Yeah, a, another little tip and trick, a lot of times people say that the podcast either doesn't work for them or they can't catch up because it, the podcast comes so much later in the week or things like that. Um, you can watch the Twitch VOD of Dice Camera Action immediately after the show. Oh, okay. And Twitch as a phone app will actually allow you just to listen to the audio even without the screen on. Oh, that's A lot that's of people great. don't know that because YouTube, you can't do that. Right. Um, but you can... Uh, you can choose audio only on Twitch, or you can just lock your phone and press play on the outside, and it will bring you just the audio. It's That's a little Twitch, Twitch trick. I love it. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. I will start using that trick. Uh, so we've got just a few minutes left. Let me see if I can find uh, some. We've got a lot of questions here. I'm trying to find the really crunchy ones. Uh, <laughs> I love that Evelyn is sitting next to me now. I chair. know. I'm like, I'm going to move it over. She's going to really sit over great. there. Okay. Uh, is the dynamic between Evelyn's brother and her uh, and her part of why she's so uncomfortable with the prospect of sainthood or the statue? Like, uh, Brighton, would like, Brighton would like this, so I can't. Or is she just more humble by nature and her brother doesn't play into it as much? Mm. The reason that I have her reacting that way to the statue and sainthood and all of that is because what she's dealing with right now is this um, fear of having her identity taken from her because she loves Lathander, she loves Paladin Hood, she loves helping, but she has in many ways kind of like strayed and gone on her own path to become an adventurer. And she's allowed these people that she's with to become so important to her that she doesn't know for sure if she's willing to give them up. If say the church was like, Evelyn, we are sending you somewhere else and you need to leave those people behind. Um, she honestly doesn't know if she could do that. And that's the first time in her life that she's ever had something be that important to her. Mm. And so I think the aversion to sainthood and the statue and everything is like, hey, don't make me such a paragon of the church. Like I, I, I like the life I have now don't notice me because I don't want you to take me, I don't want you to take me away from it. And I think the, I think Diaz has said some stuff about this that's uh, really poignant, but basically that like the challenge for her is going to be integrating those two sides of herself and being like, I can be both a paladin who is a major part of the church, who maybe um, allows those honors to be taken on, um, but also I can be someone who has chosen a family and, um, who can do the most good by being an adventurer that maybe isn't, uh, that maybe chooses their own path, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, so I think Brighton certainly plays a part in that, in that he's part of her family and a lot of the compulsion to be this perfect paladin probably comes from her family and the desire to choose her own path probably comes from the fact that, let's be realistic, she never did really choose paladin life, even though she loves it. Um, so it's definitely tied up in him, but it's not necessarily directly because of him. Hmm. Okay. That's a great answer. Uh, and that's a perfect segue into uh, probably the last question for you before we let you run off and get to work. <laughs> um, how would you like Evelyn's character to grow further in the future of DCA? <sighs> Evelyn's, um, she's very powerful and she's very... I don't know if I would say decisive so much as she acts quickly, mm -hmm. but she's shown a lot of self-doubt and a lot of um, lack of kind of self-actualization almost. Um, and so I would like to see what I just talked about, that ownership of, um, and I, I think this is really interesting. I think it's really important because a lot of the the tropes around this kind of story are like, ah, she's a servant of this god, but she realizes that it's more about herself than it's about this god, and she doesn't have to do everything that god says. It's not like that, because I think Evelyn's relationship with Lathander is very real and very important and very fulfilling for her, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's about, like, giving that up. I think it's about allowing herself to have that relationship 
and to serve Lathander completely and wholeheartedly and also allow herself to become actualized as an individual and within this group of people um, and allow other things to be important to her um, in concert with and not in conflict with mm -hmm. that other relationship. So in short, I'd like to see her develop a little bit more like self-confidence or self-love. I'd like to see her, um, you know, consider to continue to consider this question of what do I want? Mm -hmm. um, and not meaning like, what do I selfishly want, but how do I best serve Lathander and my friends and um, have fun and enjoy my life? You know, those things. So um, I think that that will come through many of these relationships that she's building. She's a pen pal with Omen Drawn. She's special friends with Todd from the, the city guard. She has this like uh, thing with Paulton that she thinks is over, but maybe isn't. Um, and I think one or some of those relationships will finally come to a head where it's like, you have to really make some decisions about who you are and what you want and what you want your life to look like. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that'll be really cool once that finally happens. Yeah, I agree. I was looking for the Strix and Evelyn buddy cop team up show, <laughs> but uh, you know, that, would, that was a good answer too. <laughs> yeah, the relationships that she has with each member of the party too. I mean, I'm just talking about these potential other like romantic relationships, but each of those like DF being someone who um, provides her leadership that she trusts, but also looks to her for um, kind of a moral compass mm -hmm. and Strix being someone that she um, confides in and like needs by her side and and really is like a sister in arms but also that she kind of like supports and protects and Paulton being someone that she doesn't think she has any ownership over but just like wants to be near because he makes her so happy those are all like really telling things about a person and it's fun every week to kind of just like continue to open up each character in the context of the way that they relate to each other. So I think it's going to be a good season. That's awesome. Uh, so I think we're going to go ahead and close it here, but I want to thank you so much for joining us. I know that you've got a very, very busy schedule and I appreciate you coming to uh, help support us, talk about Evelyn and, uh, and give us some amazing backstory. I really appreciate it. I think this yeah, is going to end up being you. a must watch for DCA player, uh, DCA watchers. <laughs> Thank you. I'm always so happy to come on and chat with you guys. I really appreciate you kind of uh, continuing to make our characters even more real. The fact that they're in the Idol Champions universe really validates them and gives them a whole a whole new family, too. So we appreciate it. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Wait, how do I do this? I don't know. This is when everything goes to heck. <laughs> All right, maybe that worked. I think it worked. All right, so Anna and uh, the little tag for, uh, oh wait, I can do, no, that's not gonna work because the news is gonna get messed up. Maybe, no, we're just gonna do it here. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us for the stream. It was uh, super fun to sit and uh, chat with Anna. Hopefully I didn't get a little too starstruck. Um, I love DCA, I love uh, that whole crew and it was super cool to, uh, hear a little bit more of that backstory and, and sort of the character motivation that Anna brings to the table uh, every week. If you're not watching DCA, I highly recommend it. Uh, Tuesday afternoons on the Twitch slash D&D channel. Um, you can also catch it on podcasts like I do. I just download the podcast on my iPhone and listen to it on the way to work. Um, it's a, it's They have an amazing group on that show and we are super proud to uh, have our little part of it uh, in the game. You can see we've got... Uh, We've got Evelyn, we've got Diath, we've got Strix all together blasting through this uh, Frostbitten adventure. Uh, I think I'm actually going to make it, maybe not before we sign off, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's super fun. But we are, we're here to celebrate. We're here to celebrate the uh, console release. Right now we're playing on PlayStation. You can download it in the store, on the PlayStation store. Search for Idle Champions or just go to the free-to-play section and you'll find us. Um, when you get into Idle Champions for the new players coming from PlayStation, uh, if you hit the menu screen, that's the wrong button. If you go to the menu screen and, uh, oh, it's not here anymore, but on the bottom, uh, let's see if I can do it with my mouse. On the bottom, right around here, there's a note if you haven't signed up for the newsletter. 
If you sign up for the newsletter, not only will we automatically credit your account with Hitch, a brand new champion, and you definitely want him, his friendly buff is amazing, uh, we will also credit your account automatically for chests every week. So every week we send the newsletter out, uh, and for Steam players, they get a code and they put the code into the game and they can get a chest. Uh, because of platform restrictions on PlayStation, Xbox, and uh, Apple, uh, we can't give you a code, but we credit your chest, we credit the chest uh, immediately if you're signed up for the, um, if you're signed up for the newsletter. So you'll get back in the game and it'll say, hey, you've got a gold chest, do you wanna open it? And you'll be able to open it. Uh, and so sign up for the newsletter, it's the best way to keep up to date on all the new Idle Champions news. We've got weekly content coming out every single week with the exception of the week when we have an event, because that's a two-week process. Um, but uh, every week we'll send out new chests. Uh, normally they're the, the weekend promo chests, so you can get a taste of the, the cool promos. Um, every week we have a, a promo where we juice up certain characters and make them really strong for you, so that'll help you get through certain variants that you may be having trouble with. Um, and uh, and we're super excited to be on PlayStation. Like I said, the launch was yesterday. Uh, it, all of our feedback so far has been super excited. We've heard from players from the UK and Australia that they want to get the game. We're going to be looking at the new uh, at the new regions uh, shortly. Uh, probably not before Christmas, but right after the holidays, we're going to look at that. Uh, the PlayStation 4 launch for us is a huge milestone here at Codename Entertainment. It's the first time that we've put a game out on console, and so that's why we started with the limited release. Um, honestly, up until last week, we we weren't sure it was going to work you know there's a there's a lengthy process and uh peter minter one of our uh lead developers has been working so so hard behind the scenes to get everything in this amazing uh look that you have here for the for the console players and players on steam can actually play with this as well if you go to the uh settings menu and you open up the gamepad ui you'll be able to plug in a playstation controller or an xbox controller or a steam controller and you can play with this interface and the uh, awesome new portraits um, so it's out on PlayStation. Um, for PlayStation players, the Celeste DLC pack is free for play PS Plus players. So that's a $20 uh, pack with some uh, with a full suite of rares for Celeste and a golden epic uh, and some chests. And you should definitely check it out. Uh, free. Yeah. Get, uh, get your characters geared up right away. Additionally, we've just released the Founders pack on all of our platforms. It's a, 20, uh, a 19.99 pack. And uh, to start, it gives you 42 gold chests, and that's normally a $50 value for 42 gold chests. So if you're getting into the game, jump on the Founders Pack. You're gonna be able to gear up all your champions really well right from the start. Um, and uh, on top of that, we've got a ton of epic potions, epic bounty contracts. Uh, there's a uh, familiar, uh, I think I can throw it up on the screen. I go to the familiar dialogue. Uh, so right here, Iris, our logo uh, beholder, is a familiar drawn by Kat, one of our amazing artists. And uh, Iris will pop up and uh, be a familiar and help you out, uh, as well as the undead Celeste skin, which you can see on Celeste right now. Uh, she looks super creepy. Uh, in the uh, in Neverwinter, one of the other free-to-play games on console and PC. Uh, Celeste, uh, Celeste died and uh, was resurrected and uh, was in Undead for a while and was super conflicted about it. Uh, so we loved being able to bring that uh, that skin into the game and tie closer to, uh, to you know, the, the canon of D&D. &D. Uh, I like to think of our, our world, Idle Champions, in sort of like a bubble. Sometimes we talk about things that they might have in interacted with in other adventures. Sometimes we just allude to it. Um, but Come in the game, make your own characters, throw your DCA characters together, bring in Dinar from Acquisitions Incorporated. Uh, it's a ton of fun. So play on PlayStation 4, Xbox One on Friday, uh, and come back tomorrow, 12 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. We're going to be playing, uh, we're going to be talking with uh, Aaron M. Evans, the author of the uh, Brimstone Angel novels, and she's going to be talking about Farida, one of our uh, other event champions and a uh, really great DPS champion. Uh, so I'm running out of time, so I'm going to sign off real quickly. And thank you all for joining us. And uh, hopefully Dylan will be back tomorrow. But if not, I'll be right here to uh, have some fun. See you later.